If you go in your Bibles, God has been just churning this text in my heart. It's such a small text, just churning in my heart for the past probably maybe one or two months. And I've been looking for a place and God kind of confirmed this week that I should open up this conversation for us. Because I sense, as uh, Ruth has mentioned, we are in a season, I believe, of open doors, a season of opportunity. I want to help you, though, because I think it's important to recognize there is a juxtaposition between um, that which God makes available and what is accessible and that which you have the courage to chase down. I I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I think for our purpose, you know, I feel very called to open up a conversation with us. uh, Some of you, in fact, I see my brother over here is wearing a Go Big sweatshirt. Several years ago, I preached a sermon series called Go Big, and one of the things that I think may have, I should have maybe added to the, con- maybe I did, I'm not sure how well I did it, to the conversation is in, in, in the framework of, of going big, there has to be an accurate assessment of what it costs to go big. And I'm going to tell you something, you know, in my estimation, to, to, and I'll say about me, not about you, this is not y'all saved, I'm not saved enough, Here, let me say about me. Sometimes when it comes to what we are called to do, when we begin to analyze what it costs us to do what we're called to, sometimes we will uh, uh, shy away from what God's made available because we're not willing to step into what God is pushing us into because it will exact from us more than we sometimes feel like we're prepared to give. And I have to eradicate that because I'm going to say something. This is not to harm you, but to help you. Sometimes you're the one in your own way. We, we, love to, we love to blame the devil and to blame the enemy and to blame imps and demons. And we like to blame so many, and not y'all, the 10 o'clock serve. We, they blame so many people. And the truth, is, the, the, tr- the truth is, a lot of times, it's your imposter syndrome that gets in the way of you chasing down what God's made available. It's, it's your unwillingness to get into the mess and the mire that comes along with progress and success. It's you not wanting to deal with people or having to negotiate and compromise that can keep you from walking into what God has made available. Can I go even further? Sometimes you don't want to hear the right thing from the wrong person, and so you sometimes shy away because they didn't say it right, and God is saying, I put your blessing in their mouth. Yes, they did. They broke some verbs, didn't say it how you wanted them to say it, but are you willing to pay what it costs to have what I made available for you? Because nothing worth having is easy. Anything worth having is hard to get. Your spiritual development, you don't just sleep with your Bible next to your head and somehow you're going to be deep in the things of God. I'm going to go further. You can't just come to church on Sunday morning and think you're going to be deep in the things of God. You can't lean, and I don't mean this in any kind of like arrogant way, but you can't lean on my anointing that you're going to have breakthrough. It costs you. It's complicated. And it's, it's to the extent that you're able to kind of navigate that intellectually that you find yourself being able to successively walk into the deeper places that God has for you. But I want to unpack that. Go to Proverbs 14, verse 4. Let me read this to you. I'm going to give you a statement, make a couple of the thoughts in Genesis and in Joshua. Then I'll get to two of my four points. We'll stop right there. And then next week, I'll grab you with the next two points. Somebody say amen. Bible says in Proverbs 14, 4, where there are no oxen, the manger is empty. But from the strength of an ox come abundant harvest. Let me say it again. Where there are no oxen, the manger is, some translations say clean. Clean, empty. But from the strength of an ox come abundant harvest. Life is too short and possibilities are too abundant for us not to mobilize toward the full extent of what God has made available. Let that sit on you for a second. Life is too short and possibilities are too abundant for us not to mobilize toward the full extent of what God has made available. The availability of God's provision, listen, is not the end-all, be-all. It's our ability to allocate our resources, times, ingenuity, to mobilize, to think deeply about what it costs to calculate how we, we should move and think and what we have to abandon and what we have to embrace that is the full measure of us accessing what God has made available. God is never the problem. He's the God that completes the work before he starts it. 
He's the God that makes crooked paths straight, bring high places low, goes before us. Every time we see God moves, he's already worked out the details. What it is, is our ability to navigate how we respond to that. Not you, I'm talking, I'm talking about me. <laughs> what it will cost us, what it will exact from us, our threshold for pain, our, our ability to, to thrive in places that are messy and unformed and not developed. I love how we see the opening of the entirety of civilization. Scripture says, and then God stepped out and he spoke over a place that was formless and chaotic. And it was in the mess, in the mire. It was in the, the unformedness of, 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 uh, of humanity or not humanity of, of the world that he then begins to do his best work. And if we are created in his image, we have to have an expectation that we do not walk in the situations that are always put together. But oftentimes, the greatest yields in our lives come when we can step into the mess of life. Where it's not always together or worked out. Now, we can chase down what God has placed before us. Let me show you something. You go in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. I don't want to show you this, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to rehearse it in Joshua chapter 1. And here's what it says. And God blessed them and said to them, and God blessed them and said to them, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. I love this right here. Fill the earth. If you, have, if you write in your Bible, I would love for you to write in your Bible and just circle that word. Fill the earth. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every uh, living creature that moves on the ground. Now, here's what I want to suggest. Listen very carefully to me. Now, this is a bit of spiritual conjecture, but you see if it bears witness with you. The Bible says that God makes the heavens and the earth. Scripture says that he says this, let us make man in our own image and our likeness. Then he reached down and he forms the man of the ground. He takes dirt and changes his constitution and makes man. He breathes into that dirt the breath of life. And then man became a living soul. Somebody say amen. When man becomes a living soul, now he is set where he is made. The Bible says he reaches down, forms him up, and where he is, God speaks to him. Now, here's what God says. What we see in 28 is this. He says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. You got to get this. Scripture says that God gives a command at the place he is to tell him to go from where he is, that he might have dominion everywhere he goes. The Bible says that God says to Adam, listen, fill the earth, says to Eve, fill the earth, go out. Tread it down, chase it down. I've made an entire world. I formed you in the garden, but I have given you access to everything. You get what I'm saying? And what happens is the enemy comes in and captures the imagination of Adam and Eve and causes them to remain restricted in a place when the world was their nest egg. Now I know I'm rehearsing some old stuff, but I'm, I'm making a point. This is what happens to so many of us is that we have access. What God said, whenever God speaks, it is so. What God made available was always available, but here's what Adam and Eve had to figure out. Were, were we willing to walk from where we were into what was not yet? Were we willing to go into the unfamiliar place that God made for us? To chase down big dreams, to see how we could actualize destiny in other places around the world, or will we get stuck at this single tree because Satan convinced us there was something here that God was keeping from us? Is it making sense to you? Okay, let's go further. Go to Joshua. Bible says here in Joshua chapter one, after the death of Moses, servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Mun, Moses aid. He says this. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River to the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. Verse 3, I love this. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Watch this. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Verse 6, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Now, you got to get this concept. The Bible says God is making very plain, I have already given you all this territory. Look at these two elements. He actually sets out in the conversation the boundaries of that which he has provided. 
He gives him the structure in which he can operate. But watch this. But he says, I'm only going to give you within the framework what I provided every place that you have the, cor- the, the courage and the boldness to let your foot step. And here's where the breakdown typically happens. It's never within the framework of what God has made available. It's that we are afraid oftentimes of stepping into things that God already said belong to us. And here's how God operates. He says, I will give you as much as you will take. Listen to me. You will, listen, God, you got to get this. You will not have what God has made available. You will have what you access that God has made available. And we think if we just think it and we just manifest it and we just say stuff that somehow all that God has for us will come into our lives. But God has never organized his kingdom to be a place where he leaves us in our infant state. When you are a child, everything has to be brought to you. A bottle is put in your mouth. You are then cared for. If you cry, you are coddled. If you need to go to sleep, you are laid down. Everything is done. And guess what? If we were to continue to treat you that way, you would never grow even though your body would get bigger your mind would remain in the same frame of being a toddler but for God to grow us up he says if you want this you got to come and chase it if you want more you got to be bold and daring and courageous to step into what I made available for you making sense to you so I said said this so 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 okay why'd you read the Proverbs I'm gonna tell you why because when it comes to this idea of what I have positioned relative to the power of God, access of God, and what you ought to do, here's the question you need to write down, the question that ought to haunt the next seven days of your life. I want this to keep you up at night. I want this question, I want you to be eating breakfast and lose your appetite when you think about this question. I want this question, I want you to be at work and came folks, start daydreaming when you think about this question. Here's the question, it's so simple, it's profound, pay attention. Here's the question, what do you want? Listen. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? You want. I don't want to hear excuses. I don't want to hear who didn't. I don't want to hear who did. I don't want to hear how long. I don't want to hear you failed. I, listen, I didn't ask you all that. Don't tell me where you've been and what happened and who robbed you and who stole your idea and who jilted you and who caused you to leave the church. Listen, I, that's all important. And please call your therapist. I'm, I'm begging you, call your therapist. But, but I'm asking you a single question. The question is, what do you want? What do you want spiritually? Who do you want to be as a man of God, a woman of God? What do you want economically? What do you want to live? What place? What, how do you want to operate in culture? What do you want relationally? How do you want your family to be constructed? How do you want your friendships to What do? Don't tell me what the culture is doing. Don't tell me how the devil is moving. No, don't tell me how demons are acting. Don't tell me how you're afraid because I know you are. That's not the question I'm asking you. I'm asking you this simple question that ought to wake you up and put you behind the bed at night. What is it that you want? Because I'm going to tell you something. Listen very carefully to me. Because nothing else matters. We like to make it spiritual and deep. And we like to pull all this. Listen, nothing else matters. Can I tell you, this is why the Spirit of God is trying to get a hold of your heart. Because Jesus, help me. Because he knows he can't even want it for you more than you want it for yourself. The Bible says it is not God's will that any should perish and yet a whole lot of folk going to hell. Because God can't even want heaven for you more than you want heaven for your... What? What do you want? God just begin to challenge me. Jeremy, what do you, what do you want? 
No, I, I, and, and you know how we do. We give God all these things. Well, what about this and this? What about that? And what, this is God, God is, but what do you want? You hear what I'm saying? All right, now I'm going to give you these two points because it's already 9 o'clock. I'm got you. I'm got your way. So, Bible says that when you have ox or oxen or when you don't have them, the stable or the manger, the barn is clean, is empty. It says, but for those who want abundance, I'm paraphrasing, you're going to have to recognize that the presence of the oxen is what helps for you to perpetuate or actualize the abundance that you feel entitled to by virtue of God's word. When I think about this, what I want to suggest to you is that it all starts this idea of ambition. See, you set the parameters of growth by your willingness to embrace what it takes to come or cover more ground. What you have is oftentimes directly correlated to what you aim to accomplish. What do you want? No one else can want it for you, and it's not enough for people just to see it in you. Now, you got to get this. When you look at this, this illustration, it shows a farmer or a person that, listen, understands the importance of being able to raise up a greater harvest. But that person has a decision that he has to make. If he wants a greater harvest, he's going to have to lean into a process and or lean into a reality mentally that gets him that harvest. And so with that being the case, the Bible says that that person has to ne negotiate this idea that if I am to till the ground myself, there's only so much I can do, so much I'll have access to. There are limitations to my strength, limitations. I can get out there, I can dig up the ground, I can plant seeds, but the truth is because I'm just one person with limitations, there's only so much I can get. Now watch this, and my expectation of output has to be commensurate with that which I can place in. I cannot expect more if I don't have more to put in. You don't expect more out if you're not putting more in. And it's not that you're lazy. It's not that you're just fly by night. But the truth is that our strength is finite. There are limitations. Watch this. And so the farmer recognizes that he wants to have access to abundance. He wants to go further. He wants to bring in more. So he has to make a shift. And the shift he has to make is that he has to invite into the process external elements that certainly come with complexities, but ultimately because of what he wants, he's willing to endure what it takes to get what he wants. Now, you got to get this. And so for you and I, when it comes to us wanting to walk in a greater level of power and impact, a greater level of spiritual fortitude, a greater le level of financial gain or a greater level of walking walking in promise and possibility, we have to recognize that it calls us to do something different than we're doing right now. Hear me, family of God. Everything you are getting in your life right now is a reflection of the level in which you have operated at present. If you want something different, you have got to do something different. If you want more, you got to pour more in. If you want to harvest more, you've got to sow more. But the truth is the ambition question has been problematic because we have taught people that having ambition is of the devil. We taught ambition is somehow arrogant or ambition is hubris or ambition is inherently selfish. But I'm here to eradicate that. You and I ought to have something on the inside of us that says, Lord, I thank you for where I am right now. I praise you for what you've done right now. But God, I heard that the old folks say you go from glory to glory and strength. To, and so if you can do that, then I got a sneaky suspicion. If I keep on pushing, I'm going to get more out of based on what I put in. But family God, I need to take the governor off your life. Don't you for a minute be sheepish or timid about saying, God, I want more power. God, I want more strength. God, I want a greater anointing. God, I want to walk in a greater place of authority. God, I want to walk in rooms and see atmospheres shift to the glory of God that's resting on my life. God, I'm unashamed to say I'm ambitious in the things of God. I want more and I'm going to do what I got to do to get the more that I'm expecting. I, I, I need to help you. 
Because sometimes we have individuals in our lives and I look at them and I see them and I love them because I want so much for them. And I realize, Jeremy, you can't want more for them. You can see the business in them. You can see the, 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 the game in them. You can see the strength in them. But it doesn't matter how much I see it in you if you don't see it in yourself. If there's not something in you that says, Lord, I'm grateful, I'm content by how you blessed me so far, but this can't be the end of your glory in my life. I just got a sneaky suspicion that Jesus was right when he said, greater works I would do. Is there anybody in the house that can testify? Thank you, Lord, for what you've done so far. But there's something turning on the inside of me that I just want. I want more. I want to see your power. I I want to see your glory. I want to see your strength. I, I want to see things happen. I want to see miracles. I want to see signs. I want to see wonders. I want wisdom. I, I want a new level of understanding. I want more. God, thank you that the game I already knew got me here. But God, I just think that if you give me just more, if you would just help me to take this next step, there's a greater level of glory you can yield from my life if I'm willing to go further. You, we need ambition. We need ambition. Can I just, I just sit down. Let me say, oh God, I'm out of time. We need ambition because we need to stop letting people convince us that us trying to walk a walk of power and authority in this next level somehow is us trying to compete with God for his glory. That, that's not, I'm not trying to take God's glory. In fact, I'm not even trying to take your glory because I recognize it's a scarcity mentality to think that for me to be greater, you got to be less. I believe in abundance. I believe that the same God that can bless me can bless you. The same God that can lift me can lift you. And God ain't got to take yours to give me mine. But I've got this thing in me that says, Lord, I just believe there's something deeper and something better. And my ambition, watch this, is not based on me trying, hear me, child of God, to in some way enrich myself. Because here's what the Bible says. It says, let your light so shine before men you ain't gonna help me teach this part that folk will see your you ain't gonna help me teach the Bible tells me I don't have to hide that I'm balling out and I'm blessed and I'm walking in abundance and I'm doing God's will I don't have to hide that let the world see how God is blessing me as I walk in my purpose and my destiny because when they see God bless me they'll turn their face toward glory and say it couldn't have been nothing but the grace and mercy of an amazing God. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I'm not competing for God with God for glory. I'm trying to get God more glory. I, I'm trying to do more that I might bring glory and honor to his name. I, I don't have time to talk about y'all sit down. Let me just say this next part. So it's ambition. Ambition. Ambition ain't bad unless it's selfish ambition. If you're just trying to come up, if you're just trying to work the system for your own benefit, your own blessing, that's bad. <laughs> but can I say this conversely? God, let me say it the right way. Equally as bad to trying to come up and work a system for your, for your self-enrichment, equally as bad, is shying away and doing nothing because you're lazy. They both serve you. There's some things that God is calling you into, but because you're afraid of the cost of what it will exact from you to do what God has said, you have shied away from opportunity and possibility because you don't want to have to work that hard. It shouldn't take all that. And I'm going to tell you something. That's the same thing as being selfish and trying to do something to bless yourself. God is saying, I don't want nobody out there running and working to bless themselves. At the same time, if you sitting around doing nothing because you're lazy, you are still not honoring my glory in your life. Difference between grieving the spirit and quenching the spirit. You grieve the spirit when you operate in a way that's inconsistent, but you quench it when you don't do nothing. And God ain't blessed by neither. We need, listen, we need some sanctified ambition. Can I just say this? Get the blame game out your mouth. Stop playing the victim. 
Stop saying who didn't and who wouldn't and who couldn't and how it is. If we believe that if God be for us, who can be against us? I got an army of heaven's angels standing behind me when I... It's ambition. Here's number two. I got four minutes to tell you about this. Here's number two. Number two actually is a, a byproduct of number one. It is complexity. It's com- complexity. See, when the farmer, listen to me, when the farmer operates independent, watch this, he only has himself to navigate. When the farmer operates independent, oh God, I missed some verses I'm supposed to give y'all. Can I give them to you really quickly on the first point? All right, here, two, two verses. I'm going to tell you about because I can't. I've got time to read them to you. Here, here's the first one. First one is Matthew 5, 6. Write it down. It says, blessed are they who do hunger and thirst for righteousness. People who, who are ambitious for righteousness, ambitious for just ambitious. He said, those are the people that are going to be filled. That's what I'm saying. You, you, you hear God is saying, this. he's saying, look, why do you think I'm just going to do it for you? I'm looking for people who want it. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for it. I'm looking for them. All right, here's the second verse in that same point is Philippians 3. I don't have time to talk about Philippians 3, 13. The Bible says, Paul says, I forget those things that are behind me and I press. Why? Because I want it. Jesus, help me. God. I, that's why I press, because I want it. There's something more that I'm after, so I press. Here's a third one in verse in that same area is Mark 10 and 46. Mark 10 and 46 talks about the fact when, when you have uh, individuals, I, I, I don't have time. Let me, let me keep going. It's two minutes and a half. Two and a half minutes. All right. Mark, write down. Mark 10, 46. It, there it is. I, I don't want to, I don't get into it. All right. Here we go. All right. Okay. A little bit. Blind Bartimaeus. Remember him? Sitting by the side of the road. Jeez. I, I have. I, I, that's a whole sermon by itself. He sat there and people told him to shut up. You're too loud. You want too much. You're too bragged up. You out here making all this noise. And Brian Bush said, I don't care what none of y'all think about me. Jesus, the son of David. I want it. I, I'm not ashamed to be ambitious. I need a mi- Okay. Okay. Here's the second one. Second one is complexity. The inclusion of other elements requires systems and coordination. The calculus requires greater deliberation. Here's what I mean. When a farmer, listen, when a farmer, I'm almost done. When a farmer is farming by himself, he has no one to coordinate with. He doesn't have to worry about timing and temperament. But the minute you include anything else, it becomes complex. Because now you're having to factor in a multitude of variables to get them to work collectively or collaboratively to bring about that what you want, right? So you got, you got, um, you got an ox. The ox has a different temperament. Ox, ox, oxen, they're strong both physically and of will. And you have to domesticate. And you have to understand the times and the seasons. Understand the way in which you are to drive and You can't just do it when you want to. You may want to get up at 2 a.m. in the morning and do it, but when you got someone else working with you, you have to factor in their calendars and their time, and so it becomes complex. Can I say this to you? And sometimes the reason that we don't walk in abundance is because we shy away from complexity. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> let, me say it, let me say it this way. We have to stop being satisfied with easy answers and easy systems. Listen, complexity is only the reality, listen, of the unfamiliar. I'm saying it again. We have to stop being satisfied with easy answers and easy systems. Complexity is the reality of the unfamiliar. Listen, it's only complex until you understand it. How many of you in this house right now have advanced degrees? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you have uh, doctorate level degrees? Raise your hand. Okay. Good. Are there any um, medical doctors in the house? Anybody's medical? Okay. I see one in the back. Thank you so much. L- let me use you for a minute. You ain't got to talk. Don't get nervous. We're going to have a rhetorical conversation. When you were in seventh grade, if someone were to come, and I think I know you, is that Sister Kimball in the back? I think she's a, she's a gynecologist, is that right? 
Yeah, okay, all right. So, see, I know my members. You all say amen. I know. I got a college. All right, so I got, I got to hurry up because uh, Gail got to go. All right, she got a party she got to get to. All right, so. So, if she's Sister Kimball in the seventh grade, if they were to sit before her a textbook with the details of how it is to execute whatever behaviors needed to successfully treat a woman for whatever her condition is, it would be Greek to her. It would be too complex for her to apprehend. Now, if as an adult, she were to lean into her experience as a child and decide that that which she wanted, which was to be a physician, was not a worthy advent because it was too complex based on her seventh grade understanding, she would keep herself out of that which she just needed to become familiar with. Because as you handle and get involved with a thing, though it may be complex at first glance, the more time you spend, the more energy you exert, the more hours you study, the more ways in which you kind of put yourself in the situation, that which seems like Greek at first becomes native to you because you made the investment of familiarizing yourself with the information. Jesus. Help me. <laughs> and here's what's happened to so I'm, listen, I'm preaching some fussing today. I'm sorry, y'all. I love y'all, but God's talking to us. What God is saying to many of us right now is that we are in a season and a stage where we are assessing the complexity of a circumstance to do ministry or life or business or relationship or spirituality at a higher level. And because it seems too complex, we are walking away from what God is trying to push us into. But family of God, it's not too complex. It's at present just unfamiliar. And if you will spend the time in, uh, um, in allowing yourself to dig in to the information, you will find that that which was hard at first will become second nature to you. And what God is saying is there are seasons and times when God is trying to shift you, but you're saying to yourself, it's too hard. It's too difficult. But God is saying, but what do you want? You said you wanted to go higher. You said you wanted to be blessed. You said you wanted to be a blessing. And guess what? If you want the things that you said, it's going to be a complicated scenario in the beginning, but if you'll familiarize yourself, if you'll jump in and work at it and work through it, God is saying, I'll begin to make plain to you what you put some time behind. And God is calling somebody in this house to a deeper level of embracing the complexity. Family of God, yes, the barn is clean, but the barn is clean and it's simple because you ain't got nothing in the barn. But if you recognize Oh, I'm going to finish this today. <laughs> but if you recognize that sometimes the complexity of having to deal with a multitude of issues will bring a greater level of outcome, abundance, and yield, you need to do what your mama said. Get your behind in that room and study those books and stay there till it makes sense to you. Stop quitting on yourself. Preach, Pastor Jeremy. Stop quitting on yourself. Stop abandoning an aborting ship. Stop walking away because it got hard. God is saying anything that you're going to do that's going to have consequence is going to be hard. So fortify yourself. Bring in the action. Learn how to clean the stall. Learn how to pick up the feces. Learn how to navigate. And watch me bless you. Watch this. When I put my super on your natural, I'll bring about abundance that you could not have gotten any other way. Is there anybody in the house that'll testify? It might be hard, but it's going to be worth it. It might take some time, but it's going to produce. It might be to cry sometimes and worry sometimes and have to work sometimes. But I know that my God, who starts the things gives me everything I need to complete it. Lift your voice and give God a shout in here. You know what I mean? In fact, stand to your feet. I'm gonna end with this. Two verses I want you to understand. Put Matthew 9 on the screen. Matthew 9. Jesus went to the towns and villages teaching the synagogue, claiming the good news of the kingdom and healing of very disease and sickness. We saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. They were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. There, there is, there is, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot to do. Labors are for few. Watch this. Ask Lord the harvest, therefore, to send out workers to this harvest field. What is he saying? 
See, we've been trying to do things by ourselves. Jesus, the Christ, even said, I need help. And El Elder Love, here's the problem. My dad told me this a long time ago. He says, the minute you get more than one person in the room, you're going to have conflict. And sometimes we shy away from the conflict. When what we know is, on the other side of being able to navigate different personality types and ways people think and how they talk, whatever, if we can get through all of that, if we can handle the complexity of having to negotiate multiplied elements and sometimes converging and competing ideas and having to balance and measure staffs and teams and when you can get into that, having to think about different business lines and LOCs and having to deal with different ways in which you accumulate information spiritually, when you can get to that place of having to read the hard text, you can't keep just reading Jesus Web. And then you're going to grow spiritually. you got to read the hard ones you don't understand. And then open up a commentary. And then call a friend. And then get some books to help you. Why? Because it's the complexity that builds something in you. Jesus said, bring in some more people. It's going to get complex. That's okay. Harvest is plentiful. Here's the next one I want to show you. It's actually found in Matthew 14. The quick story is this. They had been with Christ. He had been teaching. The day had gone late. And the Bible says, the disciples went to him and said, look, send them away. Send them away. Thousands of people. They can go find food. And Christ says, no, let's make it complex. You feed them. The easy answer is sending them away. The hard answer is figuring out. And I'm telling you, listen, can I just say this? And I don't mean this in a harm or harsh way. Some of y'all need to shut up. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Not you, but you. Just stop asking God for stuff. Because here's the problem. A lot of what we ask for, we are unwilling to do what it takes to have it. I want to impact the world. God said, okay, build a team. I don't deal with those people. Okay, then be quiet. I want to produce children that are world champions. Okay, spend every day, 20 minutes a day with them in the Word of God. Then take them to the park and teach them how to be social. Do it. Oh, I'm not doing all that. I got to go to the club. Okay, then shut up. If you're not willing to embrace the complexity, easy answers get easy outcomes. But when you step into a place saying, Lord, I'm willing to think deeply about how I navigate this and there's some stuff, hear me family, there's some stuff before you right now, opportunities before you right now. And the truth is you've been analyzing it by virtue of the level of output it requires from you. God is calling you deeper spiritually. That means you got to fast. You don't really want to fast. That means you got to pray at 6 a.m. every morning. You got to do more things that are interrelated to your spiritual development and growth. And the truth is you want the outcome, but are you willing to handle the complexity? be people in your life that you don't even like that God's going to say go sit at their feet and let them teach you it's complex are you will do you really want pastor friend of mine said he started a ministry um, an aspect of his ministry that was highly populated by a certain demographic of people but he knew that God had shown him that he was he ought to get into this particular aspect of the ministry and he said, Jeremy, he said, I, I knew I had to go and I had to be among the people who didn't even want me there. They talked about me, laughed at me. Didn't think I was worthy of it. He said, but God wouldn't let me leave. So I had to be in that space because I knew there was something there I wanted. Something that God had placed in my heart. Something that was driving me. And so even though the environment seemed hostile to me, complexity of navigating these competing ideas, the feelings I had, the way in which I was trying to actualize my destiny in the context of people who didn't want to see me successful or grow. I had to just, just deal with that until one day I got what I needed. And now those who didn't want me in were coming to my feet to learn of me because I had now accomplished what God had placed in my heart. Family, there is some stuff that God is saying to you right now. It's available to you but for you to take this next step of having a great harvest in your spiritual walk, your, your family and your business, if you want that, you're going to have to get a messy manger. 
You got to invite the oxen in. Oxen, it ain't fun. They dirty. They defecate all the time. It ain't small. You didn't see, you've been driving up, you know, Apple Valley, whatever, you know, you didn't see it. You didn't smelt it. <laughs> Is that a word, smelt? <laughs> right, you know what I'm talking about. Yet the Spirit of God is saying that if you, listen, if you want to clean, if you just want a simple, easy, pristine life, there's no issues, no mess, no drama, whatever, fine. But I promise you this, the output is going to be small. If you're, if you're okay with that, then God bless you. But if there's something in you that wants more, it's willing to embrace and be bold about your ambition and what it takes, and then to, to walk into complexity with the peace that God can give you what you need to accomplish what he's called you to. God said, that's, that's where the magic happens. It ain't just what I can do for you, it's what you can grab from my glory. And when we partner together, my super and your natural, the sky is the limit. You sense what I'm saying to you, family? Come on, every hand lifted. God, we thank you for your goodness and your glory, for your mercy, your love and kindness. Thank you for the privilege of being gathered in your name. But well, we believe by faith you are calling us to a new level, a new place in you. And it is your will and desire, Lord God, that that which you've placed in us would call us. There is something that you are moving us in. There's an open door you've placed before us, Lord God. You're calling us deeper spiritually to a deeper place, Lord God, a spiritual fortitude in you. You're calling us to a higher place, Lord God, of success and impact in our purpose. You're reconstructing our relationship, Lord God. But you are requiring of us that we step into it. That we are unashamed about our desire, Lord God, to have more in this life. More power, more presence, more impact. But we're willing to take on what it takes for that to happen. So God, I pray that every heart that is lifted in this moment, Lord God, that has said yes to this word, that you, Lord God, would meet them in this place. That you would affirm what they are sensing, that you, Lord God, would give them the path. You said in all of our ways, acknowledge you, and you would direct our path. We are acknowledging you now. We're saying yes and amen right now, Lord God, so do it as only you can. I'm going to ask our ministers to go to the wall right now really quickly. Ministers to go just really fast elders, prayer warriors. I'm going to close this service. If you need prayer today, you need to pray through, you need God to meet you in a very unique way. They're on that wall. Don't run from this word, but just step in and allow for the ministers to pray with you before you leave. God, we give you glory. And now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest from about with us now henceforth and forevermore and every glad heart with a big voice said amen. God bless you. I love you. Have a great